morning, and uh, welcome to those who are uh, watching the webcast. You know, probably everyone should have to introduce their boss uh, once a year or once every three or four years because it actually makes you sit down and read their CV. So, you, you know, Dr. Phillips has uh, always been a very impressive guy to me, but actually when I summarize a CV, I can't tell you basically how much you've gone up even further in, in terms of accolades and, and how I view you. So, so let me tell you a little bit about um, uh, Dr. Phillips. Uh, first of all, he's the Houston Methodist Chief Medical Officer, and he also runs our physicians organization. That's a title he needs to put on that. He's really the chief cat herder around here. <laughs> he's responsible for all the docs basically who are employed here, and that is not an easy job on a, da on a daily basis. He's the Executive Vice President, Chief Medical Officer, and the Quality Officer of Houston Methodist, and the President and Chief Executive Officer of Houston Methodist Specialty uh, Physician Group. That's what we are often refer to as the Physicians Organization. And he's a Professor of Medicine and holds that title at Will Cornell College of Medicine. Let me go back a little bit and tell you uh, how he got here. He graduated in 1980 from ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai with a combined MD and PhD in Molecular Biology. Now that got my attention. And he won the Elester Award in 1980 uh, for being first in his class and the graduating class. He completed his residency in internal medicine in New York City at Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, and did fellowships in both cardiology and hypertension at Mount Sinai. So not only basically is he uh, an accomplished researcher, but he's an internationally recognized board certified cardiologist and really one of the preeminent experts in hypertension and cardiovascular disease. And he served as a principal or co-principal investigator of more than 60 clinical trials in cardiovascular disease. We often see him as our administrator, but I mean, there's some significant clinical and research depth really behind getting to this kind of lofty title. His sources of support for this research include 20 consecutive years of NIH funding. Not easy for a clinician. And he's currently the principal investigator of the Texas Project. And that stands for Transitions Explored and Studied. And it's really a combined Texas Medical Center program looking at transitions of care. And he heads that up. And this involves many of the institutions that are here and things that we need to do increasingly uh, more in the medical center. He's published nearly 170 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters. And he's the editor of the textbook. I'm sure a lot of the information you're going to hear today comes from his textbook on America's Health Transformation Strategies and Innovations. It's published last year by Rutgers University Press. He also just happens on the side to be the editor for hypertension uh, in the Journal of the American Car College of Cardiology and a member of the editorial boards of the Journal of the American Society of Hypertension and our own internal journal. Prior to joining uh, Methodist, uh, Dr. Phelps was a professor of medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, where he was senior vice president and the director of the Heart and Vascular Center of Excellence. Uh, previously, he was a professor of medicine at NYU, chair of the Department of Medicine at Lenox Hill, and professor of medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. A lot of experience, and we're very uh, beneficial for that kind of experience that he brought to this job. He's a fellow of the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, American Society of Hypertension, American College of Physicians, and was a recipient of the Heart uh, of Gold Award from the American Heart Association in 2010, was elected to the Association of University Cardiology in 2012, and the recipient of 2013 American Heart Association Torch of Strength Award. He's currently the Secretary Treasurer of the American Society of Hypertension and founding president of the American Population Health Society. <coughs> so I don't know about you, but I had really no idea of the multiple achievements that the guy who leads the physician's organization, the chief uh, quality officer in the hospital actually had. So with that background, he's going to talk to us today about what he's become an outcomes and uh, health science uh, investigator. And he's going to talk about cardiovascular sciences, a paradigm for how healthcare leaders allocate resources. Thank, Thank you very no, much. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I can tell you, I really enjoy working here, and I really uh, love working with people like Alan and this whole group. It's really been a joy to be here for four years. And I'm uh, really uh, pleased that I had the opportunity to share with you about you know, how people in the C-suite, people like me, uh, make decisions about how we allocate resources. I want to expand a little bit about what Alan uh, talked about, because I think it, it will be helpful to you and for your interactions with me to see how I got to where I am, and also for some of you who have, who have aspirations um, to get to a C-suite position, how are the ways that you get there? And what are the types of things that I think you need to do? So as Alan talked about, I, you know, I started off as a 
a molecular biologist, and I, have, I had one of the first patents where I patented an assay to detect chemical mutagens. It was one of the first gene assays that was ever patented. We weren't clever enough at that time to really do the IP around it. But, um, but that, you know, then I went on to become a, I really, I actually, you know, what happened was I got really interested in cardiology. I thought I was interested in cancer. But I got really uh, smitten by cardiology during my internship. And so then I switched gears, and then I uh, went on to become a clinical researcher. But as an academic physician, you know, the first and foremost things that you need to do really are to get to do, your, do the research, get the funding. And you know, as Alan said, so I, was, I had 20 straight years of funding and I had a, and I, until I came here. And, but then it, you know, things always, doors open up. So when I stopped doing the, that type of work, then I figured I had to do something else, and then I turned into a health ser you know, services researcher over the past you know, two years. So you know, it was that bad when those types of things happen. So along with that, you know, very early on, I, um, I probably had a penchant for it. You know, I was one of those guys who was, um, I ran for class president in third grade, and um, you know, so I, I, always, I had a penchant for doing the leadership type of work. But you know, I, I, you know, I, so I started doing committee work early on, like right out of residency. So I went on the food committee. Um, we now call that the um, patient experience committee. And I went on the space committee. And I learned about how you know, patient, how space gets allocated, and it's really whatever the dean wants, and that's how it gets allocated. <laughs> so, but I, and I think it's important actually to you know to do those things because um, you know some people in, in I'm not going to say this. Well, okay, well, some people in leadership never say they made a mistake. Okay, but everybody makes mistakes, right? Everybody does things that aren't right. And I think, you know, what's helpful is that if you start making mistakes, um, one of the things that Judge Berline says, which I really love about what he says, is nothing um, is a problem when it's small, which is true. But um, so, you know, I remember one of the things I remember when I was on the food committee, I um, I said, you know, we don't really have to give good food because we're giving such great care. You know, uh, we're Mount Sinai. We're giving such great care. What does it matter? So when I look at that now, I mean, I cringe, right? I really cringe, you know, because I'd say, oh, my God, you know, if, we, if I had maybe been a little smarter 30 years ago and thought more about patient experience then, maybe, you know, things would have been better for a while. But, you know, I did. So I, th so I think that it's good to get the experience doing the committee work because you learn about how an institution works. But you also, you know, you, 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 know, can, you can make some mistakes and, you know, but also, you know, I got to know the dean, I got to know people. And so then what happened is then, uh, you know, because I got good at that, and I was always good at the finance part. So I always was able to, um, when, right when I started doing research, I was always able to do really good contracts with companies and, you know, and put money away. So I got put on the, uh, first the finance committee for cardiology at Mount Sinai, and then I got made head of it, you know, pretty early in my career. And, uh, you know, so that was a really wonderful experience because then I got exposed to really smart people and people who were Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, people head of Goldman Sachs, so really smart people who I learned things from. So that was really helpful. And, you know, but, and, you know, but I, wanted to, I, I wanted to be a chair. Um, I'm Richard Gorlin, you know, the Gorlin formula was my first chairman of medicine, and then Valentin Fuster I worked with for a long time. And, you know, I aspired, I wanted to move on. So I moved on to Lenox Hill, and it's that point where you, you start developing in a different type of way of looking at things. So, you know, and really what starts to happen in these roles is, and this is a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, about, you know, the ways that it's helpful to talk to people who are in the C-suite, is that we really focus on strategy, right? I mean, instead of, you know, when you're in the ac that academic role, you're doing the things which you should be doing, which is to focus on your content, content expertise, to really know your field, to know that better than anybody to know the clinical trial better, better than any single person. Um, you know, and, and, I, you know and, and that still carries you through. So you know, I had an a, a, a a editorial in circulation two weeks ago on um, a lot of these issues and how they relate to hypertension management and policy. And I was able to you know, reflect back and use things which I'd written 20 years ago, because a lot of things still help. So it's still helpful to have those things, you know, to be that content expert. But you move to a different point of view you know, where that paper that I wrote was on policy, you know, not, you know, it was a little bit on hypertension management, but it was a lot on policy. So you start to really think about strategy. So, so for those of you, like, who, you know, when, you know, we send to courses on leadership, and when we start talking about it, it's really what we're talking about is strategy, and that becomes really what your job is, you know, is to develop the strategy for the organization. 
you know, if you want to stay in an academic place, you know, you still have to keep doing the other things, right? So, you know, when I went to Lenox Hill, I had an R01, and I continued that R01. I had a U01, I continued that. You know, I, so I continued that type of stuff. And then, you know, moving on to um, the heart, uh, what's it, uh, well, I'd also, you know, in this thing, you know, at the, and, and Center of Excellence too. So those things, you know, that then became, you know, the opportunity then to interact with a lot more, you know, was to have a group that, and for those of you, UMass were watching this, uh, hello. Um, you know, that that was a group that uh, then was surgeons and uh, vascular surgeons, CT surgeons, cardiologists, and, and get everybody to work together with the patient at the center. Uh, and now, um, you know, John Keeney's taken over that role. John was here um, uh, uh, about two months ago, and, you know, he's even been more successful at being able to integrate anesthesia into that. So, and then, you know, at the C-suite level, it's just not strategy, but then also the types of things that we've really got to be looking at or um, you know, all different types of policy. So you know, here's the, you know, the framework, so how we make strategic decisions you know, one floor up. So first of all, you know, national policy. You know, we pay a lot of attention to this. I mean, these are things that really affect us. So what's happening with legislation? So the, in the Accountable Care Act or with the new act, uh, macro, which I'm gonna talk about, because you know, that's how we get paid, um, practice guidelines, all those types of things that are coming across, you know, we really look to see how does that impact us. State policy, so things about uh, waivers for Medicaid, you know, how does that affect us, how does that affect our payment? You know, we're looking at that closely now with the new act, I mean, what are the types of things that are gonna happen? How are we gonna manage, you know, all the uninsured people that are gonna occur if this act happens, and now we're gonna be in a position where we're gonna have to do, give a lot more uncompensated care. I mean, those are things that we start trying to figure out on uh, regional dynamics. So, you know, we have a very competitive market here. Uh, Memorial Herm is, is very strong. Uh, HCA just bought four more hospitals. We can't quite figure out why they overpaid drastically for those, but, you know, they're, they're not stupid, they're pretty smart, so we're trying to figure out what are they, you know, what are they doing. Uh, and so those are things, you know, that we look at and, you know, that we, and we pay a lot of attention to. So, you know, when we, um, uh, you know, one of the things I learned very early on um, from uh, Milton Packer was uh, that it's, re it's really, really actually good when you're s someplace and somebody's very competitive. So when we were at Mount Sinai and Columbia started to do much better in terms of heart failure, he was thrilled about that because it, he was able to go to the hospital and dean and say, you have to give me more resources because Columbia's going to get stronger. They wound up stealing him anyway, and then he went to UT Southwestern, as you know. So, you know, from the uh, health system point of view, you know, what's our strategic vision, you know, what do we focus on that? And I will tell you one thing is that, you know, that uh, just like politics is local, healthcare is local. Healthcare is very, very regional. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I think we are very successful as a system is that we really understand our region, we understand the physicians in it, we understand the geography, we know where the highways go, we know where people are located. And so when somebody else comes in, like CHI, they fail miserably, right? So, you know, St. Luke's is tanking, and CHI, their strategy in Texas is failing because they really don't understand this market. And I think that that's, um, you know, very common that happens lots of places. So, you know, one of the things that we are trying to do as a system is not get arrogant, not get too big, be big enough that we can, I'll talk about what's called market essentiality, be big enough so that we can uh, have enough dominance in the market to be important, but not be too big that we just make mistakes. Uh, and, you know, providers, so you know, we do pay a lot of attention to providers and what the needs are and, you know, and listen to you and see, you know, where things are going and where the field is going and, uh, and how we can make things better. And then, of course, patients, I mean, to be patient-centered, you know, and to uh, keep that as the focus of what we do. So I wanna step back a second and go back up to the top and looking at national policy and talk a minute about uh, macro because this is gonna affect how we get paid. So this is the Medicare Accessibility and Chip Reauthorization Act that got, paid in, it got passed in 2015. It was uh, the most uh, bipartisan act probably in the, in the past 20 years, certainly, you know, like in the past eight. Um, the, the vote was around 397 to 25, um, you can't even get a saint to get that many votes, you know, so, um, and so it was, 
It was very, uh, and Price, Tom Price, who's you know, the new uh, secretary of HSS, uh, supported it. So I think this is, you know, whatever happens um, in the, whatever happens to the Accountable Care, Care Act, the Affordable Care Act, um, it's, uh, you know, I think this will definitely still be part of it. So this is how we got paid. We're getting paid this way now, but this will change. You know, we're, we're in the period of, of transition over the next two years, and in 2019, we'll be paid differently. But the way we're paid now is that you have, as a provider, there's a Medicare fee schedule. So this is how we get paid by CMS. There's a Medicare fee schedule, and it gets modified by three different factors. One is the uh, physician quality reporting program, so reporting how you're doing in diabetes care and LDL reduction and blood pressure control. You can, you know, you can pick things that you want to do. Uh, Value-based payment modifier, so it's a, a quality measure. And then how we did in meaningful use. You know, uh, you know, early on, you know, did you even have electronic record? You know, did you uh, do? Did you keep a list of medications? Did you keep a problem list? And now, you know, we're on to later stages of meaningful use where we're looking, even looking at outcomes. So that was a kind of um, clunky system that had all different kinds of reporting structures, and that that was now put all together in MACRA. Um, so, and MACRA has two components to it, so two ways that now that modifier is going to work. So there's still going to be a Medicare fee schedule, but it's going to be modified now by how you do in, uh, in either, uh, in, if you're in an return to payment model or if you're in a thing called MIPS. So it turns out that for those of you who are employed, you're all going to benefit from the return to payment model. I'll tell you that in a minute. For those of you who are uh, in independent practice, you're going to be in MIPS, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Too. So what? The, so the alternative payment model, so if you're in that, so, if, uh, so as you know, so Houston Methodist formed um, an accountable care organization last July. It took on its first uh, risk contract, a Medicare shared savings program contract uh, with uh, CMS this January. Um, it's a contract where uh, we're it's managing 17,500 patients, um, where it's a $220 million spend. We're at risk for either losing $33 million or making $42 million. So it's a pretty, it's, it's a serious stuff. And, uh, but there are other ways you can be in an APM, but all of you who are employed, uh, because, uh, so the, the ACO then has a contract with the primary care group, and the primary care group then has most of the patients who are the Medicare patients. Especially, the SPG group, especially physicians have a couple, especially some cardiologists and diabetologists who were recognized as the primary physician for that uh, patient, very, very Medicare um, provider. But because uh, pr the primary care group and the specialty physician group are in the same tax ID number, then we all qualify for an fi uh, automatic 5% increase in the Medicare fee schedule. So that will start in 2019. So that's a really nice bonus that occurred because of that. For those people who are not in that, then they have to publicly report on quality, on uh, utilization of electronic health record. They're going to have to start reporting on cost in 2018. And for the, it's a, uh, there's only a certain pot of money. And this is a zero-sum game. So some people, are, if you're above the mean in how you do it in this reporting structure, you're going to get money. If you're below it, you're going to lose money. So in, for two, tw 2020, there's a 4% upside uh, potential, 4% downside potential. It goes to 2025 by 9% upside and 9% downside. They're not going to change this, OK? I mean, if you look at the budget that the uh, uh, Congress, well, the, the president put forward, and and if you look at the act that was passed, um, there's going to be no more. There's not going to be more money in the healthcare system. There's going to be less money in the healthcare system. So, um, you know that you know that's what's going to happen. So, for those of you who are um, in private practice in the room, we still have opportunities for you. Um, so the you know we have Houston Methodist uh, Physicians Alliance for Quality. One of the, and one of the activities that that group does is it's been very active over several years of reporting in PQRS um, and providing quality structures for independent physicians. Um, so if, if, as long, if you, you know, they'll, if you join up in MPAC, they will do the MIPS for you. Um, this is not a big fee. And uh, as long as you report something in 2017, then you will have zero decrease in your uh, payment. Um, if you don't report anything in 2017, then, you know, then you're subject to reductions. And if you do really well, you can make money. Okay, so let's go back to and, and how do we get paid. 
So this is how we get paid in the United States. We get paid fee for service, that's the major way that we get paid. That's how we've been paid for the past you know, 50, 60 years. Um, and that's so it's a transactional type of event. So you uh, go to physician, they, they, the better care pays you for that. You get a test done, you get paid for that. So that's you know, transactional. Uh, then there's bundle payments. So bundle payments are starting to come in. So uh, those are usually around procedural areas which are discrete events. So something like a joint replacement. So you get a certain amount of money to replace somebody's joint and then you have to do all the stuff beforehand. So, and that's why people are getting better at it, right? So they're going into the homes and they are training people beforehand. They're getting into better shape. They're making sure that they can walk, that everything in the house is fine, that the rugs are pulled out, that somebody, they're not gonna get their hip replaced, come into the house, fall on the rug, break the next hip, right? So those types, you know, so those types of things are happening. And I think those are good things, right? That's making care more coordinated. It's, we're paying more attention. So, um, so that's a bundle, so you get one payment for the hip replacement and, and then uh, you know, everybody gets a, a little piece of that. And capitated payments, so capitated payments is a structure in which you get a per member per month or per member per year fee from either insurer or for the government for a certain amount of money to take care of that patient or that population for a certain period of time and that's what you get, right? And so, you know, if you're taking care of a million people, you may get, you know, $5 billion. And if you get that $5 billion, that's what you have to spend. And if you spend $4 billion, you get to keep a billion. If you spend, you know, $5.5 .5 billion, you better come up with that somewhere. So these are the um, ways in which those, these payment models are evolving. And I'll touch on them, the way in which fee-for-service, bundle payments, capitated comes in on each of these. So the journey that we have been on uh, since around 2008 or 9, and this was accelerated by the Affordable Care Act, um, it was to uh, move from fee-for-service to a more uh, vertical type of model, which at the end would be if you're an insurance company. So I'll show you how you get there. And along this route, there's increasing risk for the provider but there's also increased opportunities for coordination of care. So you start off with basic fee for service, that's volume based, there's no risk to the, to the provider, all you gotta do is get more volume. So that was the game that we were in you know, for a long time and Houston Methodist got really good at, was just the, you know, if you just bring more and more and more people in, you just charge more and more and more and if you have a good fee schedule, you'll just do fine. So, but that's going away. So by, um, by next year, 80% of Medicare payments are going to be tied to also not just the fee, but also how you do, you know, in quality. And, you know, when these types of things were started, were tried in the 1990s, right? So in the 1990s, there was an effort to uh, try to use the primary care physician as a gatekeeper because people were really getting very nervous about the cost, right? We were starting to see that the percentage of money that was being used for healthcare in the United States for the GDP was starting to rise dramatically, you know, way out of proportion to other countries. And so we just got 9%, we're at 17% now, we're planning, probably gonna go to 20% by, you know, by 2022. So at that point, the, I would use the primary care physician as a gatekeeper, it failed. And the reason probably why it failed was because there was no quality component associated. Well, this wasn't tied to quality and patients understood that and they said, oh my God, you're just rationing my care. So uh, why, why I think that this is actually going to work is because the payments now are being, te being tied to quality and the patients feel it. I mean, so when you come into their home two weeks before they're gonna get their joint replacement and go around and make sure that that house is safe and that they're not gonna fall, they actually understand that and I think that's great. And that's not they were, what they were getting you know, five years ago. So, the, so it's forcing us you know, as a community to take a more holistic, uh, overused word, but a more holistic approach to, you know, how, to our care. And I actually think it's gonna give us, in the end, more satisfaction. You know, one of the things which is, you know, occurring is, we're, is we burn out and, and resiliency. And, I, and I, I actually feel that these types of more connections that we're gonna make, you know, uh, with patients and see a, a, a overall better quality of outcome is gonna make our lives more satisfying. So then we move on to, so bundle payments. So this is still a fee-for-service model. It's still a per-click event. 
So, you know, still the more you do, the more you get paid. If you happen to be good at it, and if you happen to uh, be able to do your uh, bundle and do your services within uh, the, uh, you know, and still and make money, so you'll still make money. So the more you do, the more you make. Um, so it does reward volume. Um, uh, then you, the next step would be, oops. Okay, so uh, partial risk, whoops. So, um, and this is, um, you know, so, so like a shared savings program. So this is like the Medicare shared savings program that we are now in with Medicare. So we, um, you know, if we reduce cost, we get to keep 75% of that, um, but, and we give 25% to the government, right? So they, you know, so they, they get part of that. Full risk is a completely capitated model. So you know, if you're um, a capitated model, so it's, you get a certain amount of money for a population, for a person to take care of them for that year, and you have to operate within that budget. So it rewards lower, u lower utilization, um, and it focuses on population health management to identify those people who are at the greatest risk. And so what these, you know, all these programs also, you know, I think it's, it's shifting, you know, how uh, we, you know, how we work. And I think actually it's, you know, for those of us who've gone into this because, you know, we like those intellectual challenges of figuring out, like, you know, what's the best, you know, how to solve the puzzle. You know, take, figuring out who are the patients who really need to be taken care of using predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics, and we're starting to use machi machine language, um, you know, to see like who are the people who are really that you want to give the resources towards. That's to me very exciting, and so that's what this movement is forcing us to do. Um, and you know, because it never really made sense. I mean, the stuff about preventive care, it's okay, but um, you know, it, it doesn't really reduce cost and and you know, it doesn't have the greatest impact on, uh, you know, on well, I, I can't say it doesn't have great in, uh, impact on outcomes, because it does. But, you know, as, lo as long as, when you're doing preventive care, you know, if you, you, you dilute your resources if you give everybody, if everybody gets an echo, or everybody gets a stress test. So you, you want to then identify the people who really are the ones who need the most resources. And then the top of this pyramid here is a, a, is a health plan. So if you're a health plan, so if you're, let's say, like Kaiser. So Kaiser Permanente is essentially an insurance company that happens to own healthcare facilities. So that's what they are. They're really an insurance company. And uh, so they have, and that's very complicated, right? Because you have to understand actual aerial risk. Um, you have to be as good as Aetna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, all those places. Sometimes they mess up. So that's a very complicated thing to do. Uh, Houston Methodist did take on trying to be an insurance company 20 years ago. They lost around $200 million. The CEO lost his job. Nobody's interested in trying that so quickly. So, um, so that, I don't doubt that's gonna happen so fast. But, um, but actually, but, you know, uh, but, there are but there are aspects of it that, I, that, are, that are terrific, right? Because you know, then you really control the entire, um, uh, you, all, all the payment, you, uh, all the care it dr uh, drives a lot of behavior. So, but I don't think, you know, I would never say never, you know, when uh, we came here four years ago, the idea of having an ACO was like, forget about it. That's like, you know, never gonna happen. And uh, now we have an ACO, right? So, you know, I, I, it's not out of the realm of possibility that we could have an insurance company in five years. So let's now look to see about, you know, what are the kinds of things that are on our radar you know, and where does where do cardiovascular services fit into this? So these are the things you know that, that are on our radar. So you know we're interested in burnout and resilience. We're patient access, telemedicine, safety and quality, starting the ACO, macro, implement, implementing Epic, shifting payer mixes. So you know we have we've had a big shift in our payer mix over the past two years. So what does that mean? So you know we get uh, we have two big. Uh, buckets of payment. We have a big Medicare bucket, and we have a managed care bucket, which is commercial insurance. On the Medicare bucket, we lose $1,000 per patient. We lose $400 million a year. You want to know really what the mission, uh, the mission of Houston Methodist is? So, you know, it is Medicare, right? So, you know, if you want to know, like, what, you know, what's our mission statement to, to, to make enough money on the other side of the business so that we can take care of the Medicare patients. On the Medicare, on the commercial side, we make money. And that's across, and that's across, it's called cross subsidization. So it's a cross subsidization of the Medicare population by the commercial insurance business. Last year, 
So, right, so two years ago, we made $250 million as a system. That enabled us at that time to be bold enough to build a new tower, to expand west, to expand Sugarland, to open up the woodlands, to buy um, Christus, to, do, to go on a spending spree. So last year, we had a 2% shift in our payer mix. That was 80, so we made $80 million less money because we went from, we had a 2% shift from commercial to Medicare. $80 million less. So instead of making you know, 230 million, we made 150 million. If we have that 2% shift this year, so we'll make 70. If we have a 2%, and, and the population in Houston is getting older. So they're getting to more Medicare. And we also happen to have had a slump in the, uh, I don't have to tell anybody here. So, so you know, 100,000 people lost high paying jobs, right? So, so, we, that, so that's one of the big reasons why we're doing the Medicare Shared Savings Program, because we gotta find a way to not lose $1,000 per patient. So we have to figure out a way not to get those patients admitted, to take care of them more in the primary care setting, to keep them out of emergency rooms. And then once they do get admitted, why do we hammer on on, um, on length of stay is because you know we only get a certain amount of money to take care of that patient for Medicare, and if we spend tons of it more, we lose more money. So that's why we're trying to save money. So those are you know so those are things around macro and payment, the shifting payer mix. You know the use economy we're always paying attention to, market essentiality. So you know we have to be, uh, we have to have enough services, we have to have enough footprint in our market, we have to have um, enough uh, uh, notoriety that we have to be on, that every plan needs us. So the Blue Cross Blue Shield needs us, that um, if they, when they go out and sell commercial insurance, that you know, we, we're on the plan. When it, when, and when you're not on that plan, Kelsey Siebold laid off, how many doctors? Uh, like at least 100 or 200 doctors in the past uh, year because they lost their Blue, Shield, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield contract. So when that happens, bad things happen. So you know, we have to have, you know, so that's why you know, we're putting out, you know, that's why we're growing the primary care group. That's why we're opening up freestanding emergency rooms. That's why we're engaged in um, urgent care center, um, you know, strategies. That's why we're doing the telemedicine. That's why we're trying, you know, that's why we have ZocDoc. That's why we're doing all the things that we can do to keep people in here. And, and, and that's why we spend $40 million on marketing. So that, you know, we are seen as, you know, when, when a patient in Houston, if they're buying commercial insurance, we, you know, the three things they want, they want Houston Methodist, they want MD Anderson, and they want Texas Children's. Okay, so they want that as part of their plan. And we have to make sure that we're, you know, we continue to be in that mix. So uh, you know, we're looking at strategic capital expenditures. We spend about $80 million in still, in, well, that's just in equipment. Okay, but you know, we're um, in 2000 and 12 or 13, we spent $1.5 billion to, on capital expenditure to grow our hospitals. Um, you know, regional competition we're always paying attention to, and uh, physician leadership development is something that we're, you know, very, uh, we're, it's very important to us because, um, you know, as medicine is changing so dramatically, and the way that we deliver care is, deliver, is changing, and, you know, we're moving now from you know, we're, we're putting business practices in, ha in, in the work that we do. So when you start to put business practices in the work that you do, you really have to have people who are doing the work helping you make the decisions, and physicians are key people who are doing the work. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, we're training people in leadership development and understanding finance and understanding uh, change management and understand, you know, emotional intelligence so that um, you know, because as we move now and drastically change what we do, we need physician leaders who understand how to do this work. So where do CV services fit in? So if you look at, uh, so market essentiality. And, and overall, um, it's fun for me to talk to a cardiovascular group, not only because I'm a cardiologist, but, um, you know, uh, the punchline, I'll give you some of the punchlines. Cardiovascular services is in a privileged position. It's in a privileged position, and as for, because it, it hits a lot of these areas, the things that we are focusing on as a system, the things that we need to do to be successful, you all just happen to pretty much fit right in. 
So market essentiality. So when we're looking you know, for high, when, when payers are looking for a high quality network, so we have high quality service in cardiovascular services for patient access. So we have to get people in, right? I mean, it's the cardiovascular disease is such a, a big epidemiological uh, component of what we do um, that so many people have cardiovascular disease that we have to get them in. I'm really glad that you're all are doing the course um, cardiology for the non-cardiologist because you know we don't have enough. We'll never have enough resources to get all the people in that we need. Um, so you know, g giving primary care physicians and others those uh, abilities to take care of those patients is uh, terrific. So regional competition, you know, we have a very highly competitive market. Um, and, uh, you know, if we don't make the right decisions, then sometimes we lose the business. You know, so, you know, there's, there's always something that happens where you wish you had hired somebody, they went someplace else, and then the business is growing there. Uh, for telemedicine and remote monitoring. So these are things that, you know, we're, we are um, experimenting in. Um, within the, the primary care group, we're starting to do it with other aspects of the specialty physician group, uh, and uh, you know, uh, and you know that there's going to be within a congestive heart failure, um, a new uh, a pilot on using um, an avatar-based device to help manage patients with congestive heart failure. So these types of technologies, which are you know helpful to cardiovascular patients, are things which fit into a strategy which we want because we want to learn about how to do this. So you know we support those things. Um, you know, one of the most important things, and I'm going to focus on this uh, also from my own personal experience a little bit about cardiovascular services, is that um, there's, um, you know, safety and quality has been such a focus in the cardiovascular field that, um, you know, the cardiovascular services benefits from that. So, um, and, uh, so let me just show you one thing is that, okay, so the, well, just one other thing. So, whoops. So, you know, one thing is that, um, you know, there's, when we also, look, when we make decisions, so honestly, if there's, a, if there's a positive net margin for that service line, it's the, it's, the, it's the easy button, right? So for surgical oncology, for medical oncology, for neurosurgery, for orthopedic surgery, and for ENT, uh, mainly because of tracheostomies, that in the current environment, the payment environment that we are in, they just make money, right? So, um, you know, so when they come to us and they want to hire people, they want to expand their services, um, you know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy to do it. We don't have to go through a lot of the machinations that we have to go through with other services. So the rest take a little more convincing. So, um, all right, so where does cardiology, you know, fit in with other service lines? So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you things which affect all cardiovascular services depend nationally. It, it doesn't matter where you are. And then I'm going to focus on things which depend on where you happen to be locally. So on the national side, so complexity. So the, uh, for the most part, you know, we, we make more money on the more complex patients. So ca cardiovascular patients tend to be more complex. I'm going to show you we actually lose a lot of money on the inpatient side, but we kind of make it up on the outpatient side. De uh, you know, uh, demographics. So we have an aging population nationally, so more and more, cardio need more cardiovascular services, so cardio cardiology benefits from that. Uh, volume is our highest volume service line by far. And policy and regulatory. So since there's been a lot of regulatory focus on cardiology, it tends to outweigh some of the other services. Uh, for, you know, locally, so these, this really depends on how well your place does and how well it's managed the kinds of decisions you make, so finances and uh, margins. So right now, cardiology and CV surgery do not have positive net margin, especially on the inpatient side. We kind of, I think in the end, we could probably eke it out. If you take the inpatient and the outpatient put it together, maybe eke out a little bit positive. But a lot of that's because it's, you know, so many Medicare patients, right? So our payer mix there is not good, or payments aren't so great. Uh, market opportunities. So we have a lot of competitors in the Texas market, I mean, right in the TMC and without, throughout Houston. Uh, you know, feasibility, when we do things, when you all do stuff, you're good at it. So things get done and they're successful. And reputation. So you know, we, s we still have a very good reputation from the DeBakey Heart Center and that helps us. 
Uh, I want to just take a minute about, you know, what, so again, so the public reporting, you know, so these are the things like that, why cardiology also gets a lot of attention, because, you know, for CMS. So the core measures for, you know, for quality, they, uh, the most important core measures start off with AMI, with heart failure, pneumonia, those are the three big ones. So that was, a, you know, so that we've been doing that for 10 years with, with um, impact on that, its impact on value-based purchasing, Joint Commission's been very interested in that. The, uh, you know, the ACC's had the NCDR for a long time, all the accreditation around it. We spent an enormous amount of money and an enormous number of people doing accreditations for stroke, for chest pain, for AFib, for the cath lab. You know, so it's a, you know, a lot of emphasis on cardiovascular services. Uh, with you know, Mission Lifeline, get with the guidelines, all the center of excellence accreditations. And then, uh, and then STS. So I just want to minute my own personal experience on this thing, which I can tell you gives you the, the heartache of having all the scrutiny on cardiovascular services, but also the benefit that it can happen. So when I uh, went to UMass to uh, uh, run the Heart and Vascular Center, uh, two weeks um, before um, uh, going, I got a call from the CEO and said, um, I already quit my job. And, uh, they said that, well, guess what? Uh, the CT services have um, closed at UMass. And the reason for it was that um, the 30-day mortality was uh, twice what the rest of the state was. So the mortality for cabbage um, for, uh, was 4%. The rest of the state was 2%. Um, some of that had to do with um, people in this room who made it so good, like Dr. McGilvery. So, you know, people making it, too, you know, like, I don't know, the MGH probably had a 1% mortality, so we had a 4%, so it looked really bad. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you, Tom. So, uh, anyway, um, so what happened was they closed it, you know, high death hold surgery at UM. There was, there was a betting pool about whether I was going to come at that point. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't quite understand the gravity of this until I was pulling up, um, Dr. Rudy and I were pulling up, you know, with the van coming to Worcester and um, the CEO was running after the uh, moving van with a bottle of champagne, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured, okay, something must be really bad. <laughs> so we had people come in, you know, look at this and we got better and actually folks from the MGH, um, Tom, I think you even came to help us with surgery and that was one of the wonderful things. That's one of the great things I honestly love about Massachusetts and Boston and Boston Medicine. It's highly competitive, but people really help each other. So, you know, we really got, it was great. I mean, so we had Mass General Surgeons come in and do the work for us because we, uh, we had to make some changes in the surgeons that we had. So, um, so you know, we, we found out that it was around, what was the quality issue? It was mainly around the fact, it wasn't things that were going on in the OR, but it was case selection, we didn't have the, uh, really, we weren't set up postoperatively to really take care of very highly complicated patients. And so uh, we put this team together and put a rapid cycle improvement process in place. And so here's the good part. I'll never forget this one. So I walked into the CEO's office. You know, I said, listen, this is really not good. I mean, uh, you know, I came here to run and start this heart and vascular center and, uh, you know, the program shut down. This is terrible. <laughs> So um, and he said to me, the checkbook is open. So what did we do? So we hired more people. We built new ICUs. We built new ORs. It was great, you know, and we got it back on. And then, you know, so we did really great performance. We, you know, wound up being in the, one of the top performers in STS. We, you know, um, we won the Betsy Lehman Award for uh, safety and quality because of no mediastinal infections for several years. So it really, you know, lit a fire under us. You know, and then, you know, we, we, you know, we had a terrible year in 2006, we lost around $20 million, but then, you know, then did really well after that. And, you know, this, this is the, the bars of the mortality rates. You see they came down really dramatically, you know, without having a, a decrease in our case mix index. So we were taking care of sick people, but we had it figured out better, right? And, um, you know, we had really, we had, you know, I, 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 I was interim chief of cardiology a while, so I had to sign off on, on all the CT surgery cases, and that continues to this day, is that when there are cases that are above a certain mortality risk, then the cardiology signs, so, signs off. So we had a lot more interaction, and you can see, and the, um, so, you know, so that was the, be you know, that's the benefit of it. 
So these are the factors that led to that success. We were really humble, um, we took accountability, communicated much better among ourselves. We used data to drive our, uh, our outcomes. We, we, silos got removed. It was the best way to get an integrated heart and vascular center, right? I mean, you know, because we were either gonna die or we were gonna work together and live. Um, uh, and that's gotten even better. So under Dr. Keeney, you know, now that anesthesia is now part of the, the um, uh, this, uh, the center of excellence. Um, you know, leadership standardization of what we did, right? So we got really good, like, and it, we, the reason why we were able to decrease mediastinal infections to zero was because like, we really understood, like, what we were doing to prevent infections. And then system learning. So, um, you know, things can go wrong. And then we got some publications out of it, which is also a nice <laughs> thing. <laughs> and, and, you know, so we got a few publications. Okay. so. You know, let me go back to like where, and I'm, I'm gonna speed up a little bit, because I, um, but, um, so where does, you know, so then back, you know, the C-suite part. So, you know, again, all that stuff, you know, everybody in the United States knows that if you, if you mess up your heart and vascular program, you can wind up on the front page of a, your local newspaper like we did and lose a lot of money. So that's another reason why a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, effort goes into this. So, um, you know, when we look at this from C-suites, you know, we look at from primary care to advanced procedures, you know, and when we think of the primary care folks, so what are they rewarded for? So they're rewarded for really taking good care of chronic conditions. Um, they're rewarded for participating in the, in the accountable care organization and learning how to utilize resources better, coordinate care better. Um, they're, you know, they're consolidating and then, you know, we want them to coordinate the care. So for cardiology, so, you know, we want you to be cooperating really well with primary care. Uh, we're, uh, you know, because of the alternative payment model has, uh, and because of MACRA, and there's so much emphasis on sick patients, so the, and the impact that sick patients can have on costs, so taking care of them and taking care of them in cost-effective ways is really important for us within cardiology, and again, you know, we want you to keep the patients, you know, we're still in an environment, a fee-for-service environment, and also, with, even not in fee-for-service, but you know, the, the court, if, if patients aren't go outside of our system, we can't really look at, we can't manage their care. So we want you to keep the patients within our system so that we can, you know, keep the care coordinated. You know, for advanced cardiovascular CV management, so, you know, we want you to drive best practice throughout the system, so we're supporting system work around that. Uh, we, you know, ways that we can maintain favorable payer mix, the best way we, you know, best ways that we can do that are terrific. So. You know, keeping up really good care of commercial patients is, is important. Um, and, you know, coordinating the care, again. And then for advanced CV procedures, so the things that we look at are, you know, what's the, what's the clinical impact? What's the cost of the device? What's the, you know, will this impact our payer mix in any way, shape, or form, negatively, positively? Uh, we want to understand its impact on throughput and efficiency. Uh, what are going to be the volumes and what's going to be the impact on reputation and research. So let me just go through the three worlds here. So what are the drivers of our inpatient administrative priorities? So number one, you know, what percentage of volume does, this under, does something impact on and how is it going to affect uh, uh, overall economies of scale? Um, you know, I'll just give you just a quick little simple example. So yesterday, we were looking at hiring somebody who's probably not going to be very expensive. However, you know, when we look at, you know, all the things that go along with that, the nursing that's going to happen with it, the resources, the space, the, the MA that's going to, you know, so those are all things that, you know, we have to take into account. Length of stay, you know, what's, how's it going to affect length of stay and availability of our beds? Mortality, you know, is going to impact mortality positively. That's always something that, you know, we're interested in, in, in doing. Um, is it going to affect our penalties for readmissions? It, and, you know, what impact it's going to have on patient experience and finance. So, you know, how are we going to get reimbursed by this? So, and then also, you know, we are very, you know, we're very focused on uh, how we do pub in publicly and public reporting and what our national reputation is. So, um, you know, so you go around outside, you see all those things of the US News and World Report and Busy. So Busy is the University Health Consortium. It's our peer group. It's something that really drives us. 
And so we you know, look at these things. So for cardiology metrics, so we're length of stay, we're like in the lower 10th, we're in the 10th percentile, not so great. However, you know, I would take that any day, you know, not to give up 30 day mortality. So 30 more day mortality, you know, we are spectacular. So kudos to all of you, right? So we're in the top 10th percentile. And all cause readmission uh, in the 20, you know, 30th percentile. So, you know, what we would like to find is a balance of this. Well, we'll keep the mortality where it is. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, there's certainly things that we can do to improve, you know, length of stay and all cause readmission. So, uh, surgery, sur cardiac surgery quality metrics. So, you know, we have room to move here. So, length of stay, you know, like in the lowest percentile. More 30 day mortality, only 50 percentile. We should be much higher. We should be much better than that. And all cause of readmission is still a lot of readmissions. So look at, let's look at inpatient finances. So um, you don't, you all happen to be in the top, which is your, where you know, don't particularly want to be. I mean, you really don't want to, sorry, some people here in general medicine, but um, it's, that's a tough spot to be in, right? So in terms of resource allocation, because you're losing money on the inpatient side. You always have to make the case. You have to go kind of saying, but I give you downstream revenue, you know? And that's, that means that, you know, but that's the, not the best strategy. You know, it's, it's a hard spot to be in. Um, general surgery as well, cardiology and cardiovascular all lose money on the inpatient side. GI makes money, um, orthopedics, I mean, or, well, no, it doesn't make money. Orthopedic surgeon makes a lot of money, neurosurgeon makes a lot of money, transplant makes a lot of money. So if on the inpatient side, CV services, which is a large portion of our volume, um, you know, is, Loses a lot of money, but transplant volume is low, but makes a lot. So that's where also, you know, it, it gets made up. So very large negative margins per case, but transplant makes a lot of money, and LVAD has a positive margins. Okay, let me go into. All right, and this is you know another you know reason. So if you go back to what I was talking about payer mix. So, you know, for heart failure and transplant. So if the, if you compare where they are in terms of our overall payer mix. So we have 25% less managed care patients in our heart failure group, right? So they tend to be older. So that means that we, you know, that's not good. That for the um, heart transplant, they tend to be younger patients. So they're sort of about, you know, the typical managed care type of mix that we have, Medicare mix. But if you then look at Medicare, you know, and then if you look at Medicare, so heart failure patients, a lot more Medicare compared to our a typical population, so that we're losing money on all those patients. And for the heart transplant, um, you know, it's, it's about 12% more. All right, what about devices? So uh, devices, we're paid 25,000 per case, but it costs almost 50,000. So um, last year we lost $1.65 million just on the devices, and because 88% was Medicare. How about TAVR? So we're paid um, 50,000 per case. It costs us 57. So we lose 8,000 per case, $2.2 million last year. So why do we do it? So, uh, oh, and also the rationale that TAVR was going, so there was a rationale about eight years, seven, five years ago that said, oh, you gotta get into TAVR because um, uh, it's, if you don't do it, it's gonna tank your valve program. Nobody will come. That's probably true. Um, but also it was that it was going to increase your um, open heart cases. That didn't turn out to be true. So we would need 440 more open AVRs to um, four times more the volume than we, no, we would have to do 440 AVRs per year. To, so four times what we do. We do about 110 per year. We make around $5,000 on each one of those. So that's, but we, so we, we haven't made it up on uh, AVR volume. We, but what Alan would say to me, that if we didn't have a TAVR program, we wouldn't even have a valve program. That's probably true. And also, you know, reputation and research. You know, it doesn't hurt. I mean, if, okay, well, I'm gonna say it very positively. It is wonderful, you know, that, um, you know, that Neil Kleinman um, and Michael Reardon, you know, are the lead authors in the New England Journal of Medicine on, on TAVR a month and a half ago, right? So that's fantastic. I mean, that's incredible for us. Congratulations. Well, I think Neil just left, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you can tell him I, <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, that's, you know, so that's great. 
Uh, and also, we're getting better at it. If you look to here, you see from uh, 2015 to 2017, we started off losing 11,000. Now we're only down to 8,000. That's because of expense reduction and also a little shift in DRG. Uh, and, and then also, look, physician leadership is very critical for us in also reducing costs. Okay, just remember, just one more thing. Medicare is taking out $50 billion this year compared to 2012 that they're paying everybody. It's going to be $100 billion per year decrease in 2022, and it's not going to get better. So we've got to find ways to reduce costs. And we don't have to give it to the device companies. The device companies make margins, our margins are around 4.5%. Right? For a nonprofit, that's okay. But the margins that device companies make are enormous. What should we give all the money to them for? We're doing the work. So anyway, so if you look to see, this is what, um, we, you know, for our devices in cardiovascular, so this was around almost 50 million. We, de we, uh, we uh, Vizient, which is the United Health Consortium, they have an arm which is a negotiation. They took off 3.2 million, uh, yeah, 3.2 million, and then, um, because of great cooperation among um, the faculty in this room, then we decided to just use fewer devices to just, I think it was Medtronic and um, Abbott, I think we're using those two for devices, pretty much for devices. So we got another $2 million decrease. And that $2 million savings enables us then, you know, when there's a very important recruitments that Cardiovascular Services is interested in doing over the next year. So that $2 million savings gives us the opportunity to yesterday and sit down and go, well, we can probably do that. If we hadn't done that, I don't know if we could. So, um, you know, so $2 million due to physician leadership. Okay, outpatient um, priorities. I'm, I'm going to just skip through this quickly because I just want to show you one final thing which I think is important for you to know. Well, first of all, we, we, we do do better, you know, we do better in outpatient. But if you look, so this is how we do on the inpatient side. So. So this is negative. So cardiovascular, CV and car CV surgery, the most negative margins we have, right? The biggest losses we have on the inpatient side. And the only, re oops, the only way that we make money is because there are a few services, ortho, neurosurgery, tracheostomies, and transplant, whoops, I'm sorry, that, um, that make that up. So those, those five services make up the entire negative of all the other services in the hospital. And, the only, and so that's, that's a wash. So our inpatient business is a wash. But so our, our outpatient net margin is very good. Right? We're getting better paid on the outpatient side. We are trying to move more and more towards the outpatient business because that's where we make the $150 million. So I know we're coming to the end. So I just want to tell you, the physician organization, you know, we want to lead medicine. We, want to, we, want, we still want to grow. We want national reputation. So that's why we fund some things which we may lose money on. Um, you know, patient access is critical, so you know, we're working on that hard this year. Um, we're working on ways to enable you to see more patients, to liberate the time that you can see people. And, um, you know, I work very hard on the finances, right, because, you know, without, uh, you know, this is an old statement, but without margin, there's no mission. And, um, you know, so, and, you know, that's a way for us to, you know, we just remember from the clinical work which is done here, the, uh, we, we fund the Research Institute at $70 million a year. So that's how that happens. You know, and so you have to be profitable to be able to do that. So finally, so here's the case for cardiology and program system thinking. So when you come to us, how does your idea fit in with UC Methodist strategic priorities? Is it going to help our overall strategy? Are you, you know, working on these metrics? Will they, you know, uh, are, are we be able to track them and improve them? Like readmission reduction, like mortality, like infection. And we're going to ask you to pay attention to resources and funding. You know, if it's revenue generating, easy button. You know, if it's losing money, you've got to figure out some other way that it's going to, you know, help us overall. Uh, you know, just look at policies and regulations and see, you know, where that fits in. And is it best for patients? And then finally, I just want to just give you a little quick tutorial on a quick business case. So when you come to us, number one, give us an executive summary. What, what's the takeaway? Two, what's, what's the context? Why is this some program that you want you know, going to be important? What's objectives? What are you trying to accomplish? What are the benefits and limitations? Why are we doing this? Whoops, you know, uh, options and decisions. Um, what is it that we're doing? Scope and impact. What's it going to include? 
strategy and approach, you know, what are you going to achieve, and the financial analysis, how much it's going to cost. If you do all that stuff and it comes in and it's rational and it makes sense, we'll do it. I think that's, that's the end. I, I think I do have maybe a minute for questions or two minutes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Phillips. Uh, I think somebody would be an inquisitive mind. It's kind of amazing to see somebody who's gone from being a molecular uh, biologist doing research to clinical research, now doing healthcare research. And I think I'm a surgeon, so we don't give a gratuitous compliments very well. But I, but I think that you represent us. He won't tell any. I w don't tell any of his friends because yeah, they'll think he's a. Do win. not tell anybody <laughs> that I gave a compliment. <laughs> so so thank you and thank you really for all that you do. Uh, questions. So please use the microphones because this is being webcast. So put your hand up in the air and we'll get a microphone to you. Dr. Quinones, the first question. Thank you, Rob. That, that was uh, pretty enlightening. And, and I just have, a, you know, you, you don't see only our situation here in where you are sitting. You also see a lot of the national. You know, we are probably in the top, I don't know, 5% or so of institutions in the country that are financially successful and, and, and pretty much have all their, most of their eggs in the right place. What's going to happen for the 85% of the rest? I mean, yeah. the picture you're painting could potentially be devastating yeah, for yeah. most hospitals in America. Look, it's How, gonna be, it's gonna be extreme, what's going to happen there? It's going to be extremely challenging you know, for, um, for academic medical centers at the time. Look, if this bill goes through, and there are 24 million people more uninsured than there were this year. And as they're serious about it. It's gonna, you know, for, um, for you know, we're, we're not gonna be that affected. We don't take care of that many Medicaid patients as it is. We don't have that many um, non-resourced uninsured patients. So I don't think we're gonna be that seriously affected. But other places, I mean, it, look, uh, I'll give you the example from, you know, just having lived in Massachusetts. So before Romney Care, all the hospitals struggled. After Romney Care, when everybody got insurance, everybody did well, right? Because now you didn't have to take care of that un uninsured pool. So, you know, it just have to. I think look, the society got to make a decision, you know. And it looks like the decision we're making as a society is that we're not going to fund healthcare. Next question. <clears throat> Rob, let, let me ask you a question because I know you've been interested in physician leadership and. And you've, your role has evolved. Now, one of the challenges that I see sometimes is that a, a, a physician gets promoted, but they want to do the same thing as they were doing right. before they got promoted. Right. And I think one of the messages, when you move into a leadership role, you've got to yeah. adopt the new role. You can't just be doing the comfortable thing that you're used to. Yeah. I think that's really, really, really critical. I think it's, I mean, and, uh, look, I think especially like on, on this, look, if, Patients come first, right? So if you're going to be, um, an, if you're going to be an administrator, you have to give up most of your patient work, and you, and then at a certain point, you really have to give up most of the research. You do. I mean, if that's what you've been doing, and if you want to move into this leadership role, because the um, you know all that effort and time, and you know, I, I mean, I've been fortu fortunate that I've been parts of consortiums, and I still get to write stuff, and occasionally I get something, and, and you know, so. Um, you know, but uh, you have to, you know, go f all, all, all into this. Any last questions? Dr. McGilvery. The Massachusetts influence <laughs> is growing. <laughs> Rob, that was a, a terrific talk, and I think that uh, your, your last comment of without margin there is no mission uh, is very, very important. And I think that when it comes down to the clinician, I mean, what, what is your advice? How can we help? with the mission right. by paying attention to the margin. Okay, thanks. So I, you know, I think that um, the more you can see yourself as actually working for Houston Methodist and its vision, the better off it is, rather than just, oh, I'm working for my department, I'm working for my own thing. I'm, you know, cause that, because I think if you see the overall picture, then you can say, okay, well maybe, you know, if I'm able to see that patient this afternoon, who maybe you know is a little short of breath and doesn't and, you know and can get some furosemide and go home rather than coming to the ED in a twelve thousand dollar admission? Terrific. Or you know if maybe I can round earlier and you know get that patient out, you know so they can um, 
you know, they're not here an extra day. Or if, um, you know, we do the cath, you know, maybe they don't have to stay for, you know, it's not an emergent surgery. They don't have to stay for five days waiting for the surgery, bumping up that length to stay to, you know, you know at a, send them, and they can go home, safely go home. I mean, I, I think even those little types of things, you know, that just say, okay, it's just, uh, and, 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 look, a lot of people will say, look, I'm not going to help this place because they're making so much money. So why should I do something that will, you know, improve the efficiency? Well, that's, I, to me, that, you know, I would just say, look, I want us to continue, I mean, I would flip around and say, I want us to continue to be able to make money. I want us to be able to build stuff, get new equipment, do these things. So I'm actually going to make that little extra effort to be a little more efficient. Okay, so let me just finish with an example of that, and that is because I'm on the value analysis team and not something that I ever thought I'd be interested in, but it's kind of fascinating. And, and so the leadership that was shown by Stuart Solomon and Neil Kleiman and meeting with their colleagues and bringing the stents down to two vendor strategies, actually Boston Scientific and Medtronic, saved millions of dollars. Um, and on the device side, the leadership by Nadim Nasser and uh, Miguel Valderabano in, uh, in doing a similar thing, is enormous impact. And I think it's very important that we engage in that because at the end of the day, I mean, I've been in two institutions where the finance is getting in trouble, and the first thing that goes is the education and the research mission. So I'm extraordinarily grateful for people in the C-suite and, and people like the physician leaders who, who help maintain that positive balance. And so thank you. Thank you again for Great, a tremendous okay. talk and Great, appreciate thanks. you representing us. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Thanks.